Support for the Capital Connection comes from United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. And New York State United Teachers, representing professionals in education and healthcare, online at nysut.org. It's the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm Alan Chartok. Joining us today is State Senator James Skoufis, a Democrat from New York's 39th Senate District. Senator Skoufis is chair of the Senate Committee on Investigations and Government Operations. Welcome back, Senator. Always a pleasure to have you here. Delighted to be back. Thank you, Alan. Okay, so, Senator, they were playing games with your district. Where are you now, and are you happy to be there? Well, folks are playing games with a lot of districts, but I'm very happy with where I landed. I, I had a, a few options that I, uh, that I spent a number of weeks I, I sort of looking over and uh, determining sort of what's, what's best for me, my family, the area. And where I landed was an Orange County-based district. Uh, now, I represented and have represented about half of the county uh, for many years now, but I extended down to Rockland. I extended up a little bit to Ulster County. Uh, now I'm fully in Orange and have almost all of Orange County in this new district, save for uh, a couple of uh, communities in the northeast corner, Newburgh and Montgomery. Uh, the whole rest of the county is, is a new Senate district. So when you get a new district with new people voting for you, presumably, how do you introduce yourself to them? Well, the good news in, in my case is that uh, it's not a complete new introduction in, in many cases because, you know, lots of folks on the other side, quote unquote, other side of Orange County that I have not represented, uh, they still know of me. In many cases, they've seen me at events. It's the same media market, uh, the Times Herald Record and News 12 and Spectrum News. And so and a lot of my work is Orange County focused. Uh, and so th that's that's good news, and that I'm not completely starting from scratch with a lot of voters who are new to the district. Uh, but certainly those that are, and, and even those that you know maybe have a little bit of, of understanding of, of what I've worked on, I uh, you know the the pitch is uh, the results. Uh, you know I'm someone who works hard, and uh, alongside colleagues have been able to deliver for not just my part, quote unquote, my part of Orange County the last number of years, but all of Orange County. And uh, so I'm proud to run on my record, uh, you know, which is, is one of uh, independence uh, and, and results. And, uh, and that seems to be resonating. Interesting. Interesting. And when you get the news that they've drawn your district the way you wouldn't like them to draw it, James Kovis, what do you do? Well, so I had I had three options. Well, I guess four options yeah. at the end of the day when all these maps came out. There was a new congressional district that I looked at. There were two state senate districts. Uh, my, my, my current district, the outgoing district, was carved into five, five different state Senate districts, which might be a record for any of the 63 uh, districts in the state. Uh, two out of the five uh, were worth considering, and I did consider. And then the fourth option was to, to not run, um, which is always an option uh, come election time. Um, so, uh, so look, you know, I painstakingly went through what those options looked like. I, you know, I did some polling. I certainly had a lot of conversations with my family and supporters and my staff. Uh, and uh, it was an excruciating number of weeks. But we landed uh, what I feel like, again, is in a comfortable and good and, uh, and, and, you know, a space that certainly I feel good about winning um, and, and representing, I, uh, and I don't have to move. One of the options would have required my family uprooting ourselves and moving, which, you know, wasn't, uh, wasn't desirous. So, you know, it was, there were a lot of considerations, uh, at play and I'm just glad I had some options. Some people didn't. Now, as chair of the investigations and government operations committee, what are you investigating? <laughs> well, the, the big one that we are, uh, that we have been working on for a while now, and I hope is in its a uh, near final throes, uh, is we opened up an investigation uh, a number of months ago uh, into the outrageous uh, rate hikes 
uh, and uh, billing hikes that we saw last winter from uh, many of the utilities uh, across New York State. And, and yes, part of that cost increase, and look, just to give you some context, me personally, in a typical winter month, I'll usually have you know, a few hundred dollars on my heating bill. And I live in a fairly modest home, you know, with 12, 1,300 square feet of livable uh, area. And uh, this past January and February, I had bills that were $1,200, $1,300 for a single month living in the same home using the same amount of heat. Now, and that was, you know, basically across the board in my district. People were slammed. And, uh, and certainly part of that was the increase in natural gas. Uh, the cost to the utility. But we are finding that there were some other uh, elements that were driving the cost increases that are not as innocent as simply the natural gas cost increasing. And so that's an investigation that we're, we've really been sinking our teeth into. And, I, and, and in, the, in the near term, we're going to be producing our findings and uh, an investigative report. So what do you suspect? That the people who are running these companies are just being greedy? I think in many cases you had uh, you had some entities, and this is not just the utility companies, mind you. We're talking suppliers, the regulators. I believe in many cases in the state dropped the ball and were not nearly as proactive as they needed to be to hold down some of these prices that were uh, getting out of control. But what we're finding is that some actors took advantage of a crisis, and you know when when you have uh, when you have folks who uh, who are, are not acting in good faith, uh, a crisis is an opportunity for those kinds of individuals. And, and that's what we saw in some cases. Wow. So I remember, you know, you had some doubts about outgoing Governor Cuomo, and now we have a new governor, Kathy Hochul. And you want to do a little comparison for us? <laughs> well, some doubts, the way you characterize it, is a kind characterization, you know, of the history between the former governor and, and my time in office. But, but look, you know, the, the new governor, I think, has really attempted to work in a more collegial manner with the legislature, which, of course, has been very welcome. The former governor acted as a steamroller. He tried to act as a steamroller, and he wished the legislature didn't exist, quite frankly. This governor has taken a very different and refreshing approach with the state assembly and the state senate. And, uh, and look, you know, we still have our differences, no doubt, and there are still you know, some things that I wish operated uh, in, in a different manner. But the most important thing is that she's, she's looking to be a partner with other duly elected uh, officials. You know, we have mutual constituents. We represent the same people. And it's nice to be working in a better manner on behalf of those same constituents. Well, you mentioned some of your differences, but what are they? Uh, well, well, look, you know, the, uh, they, they range from the more mundane and modest. For example, we had some very different opinions at the negotiating table in the budget around how to reform the state's antiquated alcohol laws. And, you know, that's a conversation that's still ongoing. I think there should be dramatic changes, and she's not quite in that space uh, okay, yet. Okay, let me stop you and, there. Let me stop you right there and say, what are some of the differences? Well, I, in the state Senate majority, came to the table with a very comprehensive set of reforms that would have really turned the tide, which is currently very much against the consumer, and leveled the playing field for the 20 million or so New Yorkers who either occasionally or more than occasionally enjoy a drink. But the matter of fact is right now we're rooted in this antiquated system. So, for example, a couple of the changes that I was looking for that were a bit more comprehensive. One is restaurants and uh, liquor stores and other retailers ought to be able to co-op buy. Right now, every single one of them individually has to go out to a wholesaler and purchase their wine and spirits and beer. And they should be able to get together in groups and get better pricing. This is how New Jersey operates. This isn't something out of left field. There are other states that allow for co-op buying. But at the crux of the, uh, the, the problem uh, that causes not just anti-consumer activity, but really uh, horrific uh, behavior with every other stakeholder in this space is that we have a duopoly in the wholesaler space here in New York when it comes to wine and spirits in particular. Beer, it's a little bit better and diversified. There are two companies that distribute wine and spirits that own about 90 plus percent mm. of market share, and they rip off everybody because they can. And that's what monopolies and duopolies do. And so, you know, we came forward with a number of proposals that would have chipped away 
at that monopoly. You've got billion-dollar companies like Southern Glazer and Empire, these, these two in particular. You know what their annual licensing fee is to be able to do business in New York? It's about $6,000. Billion-dollar-plus company, and all they've got to pay is $6,000. Meanwhile, restaurants and liquor stores pay almost the same for their licenses. So from the actual cost of doing business to trying to, again, chip away at some of these uh, monopolistic and duopolistic practices, the governor wasn't quite in the same space that, that I was and the state senate was, but that's still a work in progress. How come? I mean, one of the things that all of us do is we spend our time looking at potential motivations. Now, you're on different sides of the street with the governor. Often, I hate to do this, but often money is at the basis of this. Who are you getting money from? Who's giving you whatever support you have? Do you suspect something like that is going on? I am going to let intrepid journalists like yourself ask the governor that question. I, I have found that I only get myself into hot water when I publicly speculate on motives of uh, other elected officials. And, and so, look, we, we have uh, the, one of the outcomes of that negotiation I'm talking about is we put together, uh, I begrudgingly I signed off on uh, putting together a commission to further examine these issues that I don't need for that I don't think need further examination. Uh, but there, there's a group of folks, uh, including an appointee who's from my office, who uh, who works in my state senate office on that board, who are working on recommendations. I, I'd rather not uh, speculate on motive, but next time she's on your show, you should ask her. Okay, we'll do, and we'll have her on because we love to have her on. Okay, let's change subjects. I won't ask you a question, and you'll educate all of us. What's an IDA? IDA is an industrial development agency, and every single county in New York State has an IDA, and there are many municipalities within those counties that also have IDAs. And uh, the simplistic uh, way to explain it is that these are the entities that give out uh, very large property tax breaks to applicants. Uh, you know, new companies, projects, expansion projects uh, that are happening in those jurisdictions. Uh, many of them apply to the IDA for tax breaks, and these are the groups that decide whether to give them or not. The, the biggest tax break that they can give out are uh, called pilots, which are effectively property tax breaks, uh, but they also give out more modest sales tax and mortgage tax breaks. But the big one is the property tax break. So a lot of pressure there, right? I mean, everybody wants a property tax break. You better believe it. And uh, now, is there a lot of pressure on them, though? And that is the question. There should be. Uh, but what I am uh, increasingly finding out always, almost on a day-to-day -day basis, and this is something I've worked on for years now, almost a decade, is that many of these IDAs, they, uh, they are more interested in writing blank checks and doing whatever is asked of them by a company rather than protecting the taxpayer. And at the end of the day, those that are operating that way have their priorities backwards. Yes, incentivize good projects, worthwhile projects that need a tax break in order to come to New York. Absolutely. But don't just open your checkbook and offer a blank check. And that's what we're, what we're finding in many of these ideas, including where I am, here in Orange County, a company comes to them and says, well, we want this. And instead of the IDA coming back and scrutinizing the application, saying, okay, we know what you want, but what do you need? They don't have that conversation. Instead, they jump through hoops. The IDA jumps through hoops to do whatever the applicant, the company wants them to. And many times it results in a quote-unquote deal that rips off taxpayers. Okay, so tell us about the letter issued this week to the Orange County Industrial Development Agency. You, along with numerous municipal leaders, County Executive Newhouse and Senator Martucci, are urging the IDA to give taxing jurisdictions a more formal role in decision-making when pilots' payments in lieu of taxes agreements are on the table. I'm confused, so can you educate me and everybody else about what all of Absolutely. this is? As far as I know, there is only one IDA in the state, and that's the Rockland County IDA, that does this right, in my opinion. And what they do is the IDA, which is made up of a board, they vote in Rockland County to authorize up to a certain tax break. Uh, and then the, the negotiation is kicked to the actual community 
that the project is looking to get the tax break in. And so if the town supervisor, the village mayor, the county, the school district, they are the ones that negotiate up to that tax break that was authorized by the IDA. And so those local officials uh, who are elected in many cases and actually represent taxpayers as elected individuals, they are the ones that decide and negotiate whether to give a pilot at all. And if they do give a pilot, whether it should be that maximum amount that was authorized or something less or something minimal, uh, they're the ones in the community that ultimately have to deal with the repercussions of that tax break. The IDA board, they don't have to deal with those repercussions. They go back home in their respective communities, the board members, and they're not the ones that deal with a town budget or a school district budget that suffers the consequences of these massive tax breaks that are handed out. And so what we in Orange County, we had 29 people who signed that letter, the large majority of supervisors and mayors. You mentioned both uh, me and the other state senator, the county executive. We are demanding that here in Orange County, we do what Rockland does. We've had enough of sitting on the sidelines and watching an unelected board tell our communities what kind of tax breaks should be happening in our backyard with us having no say. We want to do what Rockland does. They do it right. And that's what that letter was about. Senator Scoofus, you have flagged the attorney general accusing ticket vendors of fee disclosure noncompliance. What's that? Uh, this is something I've worked on for a while with, with my colleagues. Uh, and in June, we passed uh, some significant reforms, first in the nation, uh, to use a Cuomo term, first in the nation reforms. <laughs> I uh, uh, in the live event ticketing space. I uh, and this this has come through uh, the committee that I chair, and I've taken a, a lead on on this uh, set of issues that affects millions of fans. And this is we're talking Broadway concerts, sporting events, uh, anyone that's bought a ticket uh, to see one of those live entertainment uh, events knows that the whole system is topsy turvy and quite frankly a racket. For Ticketmaster and StubHub and, and these other uh, industry players. And so one of the major reforms that we passed is called all-in pricing. Uh, and fans have, uh, have been taken advantage of for a long time. Uh, one of the ways in which they find a ticket online on Ticketmaster or any of the other platforms, they click a seat, uh, they click the price, and they think they see the price, and that's the price they're willing to pay. Then the next page, they put in their credit card information. And then the next page, they put in their contact information. The next page, they accept terms of service. Uh, and then you know, five clicks later, they get to the checkout, and now suddenly there's a $19 service fee, a $21 processing fee, a $15 delivery fee, and the price they saw 20 minutes ago is now double uh, what they were willing to pay. It's a bait and switch. And so all in pricing – requires that that final total price 20 minutes in on that last page needs to be posted all the way up front before you even make a single click. And this was a very pro-consumer transparency measure. Uh, and again, first state in the country to do this. What we have found, this law just took effect last week. Uh, what we have found is that almost every single platform, not everyone, but almost every single one, including Ticketmaster, including StubHub, are breaking the law. Uh, and they're not following uh, the, uh, the statute no. on all in pricing. And I, we're going to do a, a final sort of check-in this week. Give them, we gave them a little bit of time to try and clean up their act. Uh, and if we don't see that they're now following the law this week, we're going to make a referral to the Attorney General's office. So all of, all of these folks... They lobbied up. They, they bought a small army of lobbyists to try and kill this reform bill. Uh, and, you know, they were on a couple of these major measures. They were unsuccessful. They lost. And so I guess their plan B is to just ignore the law now. Uh, well, you know, I think uh, the millions of fans in New York and, and certainly I have news for them, and that is, uh, you know, we're not going to allow you to operate as scoff laws. We worked very hard. We pushed and waited a long time. Uh, to get some, some significant meaningful reforms in this space. And the expectation is that just as every uh, citizen and resident of New York State is expected to follow the law, so are they. Now, the Supreme Court in the United States has made two major decisions. One of them overrules Roe v. Wade, and the other overrules the century-old uh, concealed carry law. Let's start with Roe v. Wade. What's your reaction, and how does New York deal with that? 
Well, my reaction is a shared reaction with millions of New Yorkers and um, hundreds of millions of, uh, of Americans, in, and, and that's one of outrage and, and disappointment uh, and a, a recommitment to, to do whatever I can and we can to make sure that people's privacy is protected in this space. Uh, and so, so, look, in New York, uh, we're, we're fortunate in that we, uh, a number of years ago, codified Roe versus Wade, uh, which I strongly supported. Uh, that was back in 2019. And so mm-hmm. we, we have Roe v. Wade effectively in our state statute. Right. Uh, we, we took uh, a further step in June um, by, uh, ha- you know, uh, by passing uh, for the first time. We've got we to do a second passage next year, but having first passage of something called the Equality Amendment that actually uh, uh, that, that amends the state constitution and ensures that uh, a whole host of, uh, of classifications and uh, including, by the way, uh, you know, gender and sexual orientation uh, and, and absolutely a, a right to an abortion are protected in our state constitution, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, added insulation beyond that even of uh, codifying Roe versus Wade in our state law. Uh, so, so, look, you know, we're, we're going to do whatever we can. Uh, we are we're a state that respects a woman's right to choose. Uh, that's certainly where I am aligned. Um, but, you know, and then you look at the politics, it's had a seismic effect on uh, on the uh, the electoral outlook uh, coming this this November. Up until that court decision, I, I think most people, including most Democrats, would agree uh, we were looking at a uh, a quote unquote red wave in in November. And I don't think we're looking at that anymore, quite frankly. So, uh, and, and that is then that's because of the court overturning Roe versus Wade. The court has become a political body. And I hate to say that, uh, but I think it's clear to most Americans that against the will of Chief, Chief Justice Roberts, who has tried so hard to, to not turn SCOTUS into a political body, that is what they have become. And as a result, uh, you know, the Americans, uh, the large majority of Americans have begun to turn on the Supreme Court as a respected institution. Uh, and certainly policymakers who are aligned with folks like myself, uh, you know, we're going to do everything we can to try and insulate our constituents from these harmful uh, decisions that are coming out of the Supreme Court. Now, concealed carry, that is something that a lot of people have concerns about. After the century old law was struck down, Governor Hochul and the legislature passed a new concealed carry gun law, which went into effect last week with the exception for some professions. The New York legislation prohibits carrying guns in so-called sensitive places, including schools, churches, government buildings, and parks. Meanwhile, the age to buy a semi-automatic weapon changed from 18 to 21 this week. That measure was passed after 10 people were shot and killed at a Buffalo supermarket in May. So can you bring all of this home for us and tell us what you expect and whether this has to be changed even more? Well, look, I think that with any law, we in the legislature have to examine, uh, you know, uh, the statute ongoing. And yes, if there are issues with the law, we we absolutely should revisit it or add to it or amend it, uh, whatever is called for. Uh, And so I I don't think, you know, I don't think any public policy area uh, is is done with once you take up uh, any particular bill, no matter how uh, um, reaching it is. Um, it's always an ongoing examination. And in this case, look, you know, the, at least the concealed carry piece was absolutely a response, a legislative response to the Supreme Court. Uh, we had to respond because they effectively uh, gutted our concealed carry uh, century old law, as you pointed out, um, a number of months ago. And, uh, and look, you know, raising the age, I think, is less controversial uh, from 18 to 21. Um, and having, you know, there should be reasonable carve outs for, you know, young hunters, for example, uh, et cetera. But, you know, the, the vast majority of people do not need to have uh, as an 18 year old or a 19 year old or a 20 year old do not need to have uh, access to, uh, to to a semi-automatic rifle. Uh, and so, so that was uh, that was a measure that, you know, quite frankly, even a lot of Republicans support uh, raising the age to 21. Uh, the concealed carry piece was, was certainly, you know, I concede is, is more controversial. 
Uh, and, you know, we're going to see how it plays out. I'm hearing a lot on the ground right now uh, from county clerks and, and other administ- administrators that, um, you know, w- with these extra additional requirements that are, uh, that are in this new statute, um, you know, it's going to be a burden on their office. There may be a very significant backlog. How long are people going to have to wait? Who are law-abiding folks? How long are they going to have to wait to be able to move through this concealed carry licensure process? I think one of the things that we in the legislature can and should do is make sure that uh, that these administrators have the resources they need. Maybe they need to hire a few more people uh, in each county. We should be making sure they have the resources uh, to ensure this new law operates as smoothly as possible. I want to talk to you about the governor's race. Lee Zeldin apparently doing well. Do you have any concern that the Democrats could lose this? I certainly don't have any concern that the governor is going to lose the race, but she shouldn't take it for granted, and she's not taking it for granted. Now, look, I wouldn't characterize the state of the race as Lee Zeldin doing well. The recent poll is from a very Republican firm that juiced numbers and showed a closer race than I and I think most people think actually exists on the ground. Just a week or so prior, you had a poll showing Kathy Hochul with an over 20-point lead. And, you know, I think we're probably somewhere closer to that outcome than the four-point race that Trafalgar Group, this Republican firm, polled uh, the other day. You know, look, the the thing that Kathy Hochul has going for her is the math. We're in a very Democratic state. And, you know, as long as people come out and vote, she's going to be fine. Lee Zeldin voted against certifying the election. That's disqualifying. Uh, And I think, you know, any New Yorker that doesn't already know that, once they find out, they will agree it is disqualifying. We've been talking to Senator James Skoufis, a Democrat from New York's 39th Senate District. Senator, always a great pleasure to have you. You speak so well, and you always make turgid things very clear to many of us. So thank you for being here and showing up. Pleasure is always mine. Thank you, Alan.